Great. Okay, so I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a trip through telegraph history and um, start out with that first slide. Can you bring it up? Okay. Um, the history of telegraph keys, and it goes way, way back, and so uh, there's a lot to cover here, but I think you'll find it interesting. I certainly have for many years. Um, my own history with telegraph keys started in 1953 at the age of 15. That's me over there. And my parents had a lot of money. So I could, I said, Daddy, I want a radio receiver. And he said, okay, kid, go buy one. I said, Daddy, I want a Collins receiver. He said, no problem, just go buy one. <laughs> so I went down Radio Row in New York. I bought this lovely 75A2 receiver and uh, tune it around a little bit. And then I got my ham license. I said, Daddy, I want a radio transmitter. I want a Collins radio transmitter. And he said, OK, kid, go on, buy one. So I went down there and said, I want the 32V2. And the salesman said, sorry, kid, can't sell you one of those. I said, what do you mean? And he said, every ham has to build his first transmitter. I cannot sell you one of those. And he said, I'll sell you a kit. And he sold me an ICO with an 807 final. And I built that thing. And that was the best thing anybody ever did for me. If I'd bought that Collins, I would have been, yeah. But building a set and damn near electrocuting yourself and putting those parts in and learning when things weren't working and zap you a little bit. Oh, that was great. And then I went back to the same guy and I said, I want a telegraph key. And he sold me a 32 feet finally, but I said, I want a telegraph key. And he said, okay, what do you want? And I said, well, I want one of those fancy Vibraplex chrome plated bugs. And he said, well, okay, I'll sell you a Vibraplex bug, but how fast can you send with a straight key? And I said, well, I could send maybe 10 words a minute, something like that. And he said, sorry, kid, can't send you, sell you a Vibraplex bug until you can come here and send 20 words a minute on a straight key. And they said, it's just a fact. You don't want to go to a bug until you're good on a straight key. And that guy, again, he saved my life. I mean, if I hadn't been forced into it, this rich little kid would have had a Vibraplex bug and two Collins rigs and never have any clue about radio. So it was, a, it was a great start. And as you can see, one year later, I had not only built the ICO, but I had built uh, a great big uh, radio transmitter here, a pair of 813s. Can you come back to that one again? Okay, a pair of 813s. And uh, you can see all the goodies that I have over there. This one's particularly noteworthy. It is a... Uh, Halicrafter is DD1, Delta Delta 1. It's a dual diversity receiver. They only made about four of them, and they're just beyond priceless now. But uh, in those days, they were maybe 100, same price as a Collins. And what that thing has is two entirely separate tunable front ends, and you can lock them together, and you can hook it to two different antennas. So you can pick out which antenna is pulling in the strongest signal and listen to that antenna. It was just one of the really early attempts to get dual diversity, which means multiple antennas and picking the strongest signal and stuff like that. So I had one of those, and that's why I really got into ham radio and it's been downhill ever since. I filled an amazing amount of space with ham gear, as you can see there. And then I figured, no, my, I got married. My wife said, we can't fit all the ham gear in our house. So I bought a farm in Vermont. And back in those days, you could buy a 50-acre farm with 11 buildings uh, in Vermont for, for 10,000 bucks. So I bought it, and I brought all the stuff up there, and I've been enjoying that space ever since. Uh, just lucky at that point. Anyway, so that's my background. And along the way, I was sort of fascinated by telegraph keys because I had a lot of trouble learning the Morse code. And I always thought, there's got to be something a little magic about this. And therefore, I started collecting keys. And 
What I'm going to do is take you through the history of telegraph keys, talk a little bit about the values. Landline keys was what we start with because that's all there were in the early days. That means uh, wired telegraph uh, from one point to another point. And uh, there was a big market in landline keys, so a lot of competition for who making the best key, who can sell the most key, and who is the winner. We'll talk about that. Then we're going to look at some foreign keys, which are pretty much patterned on American landline keys, but it, they were a little bit different. Uh, the Europeans changed them a little bit. Then we go over to Spark. Spark was invented back in the days of Marconi, and we'll look at a little bit of the history of Spark keys. And then we go on to Bugs, and Bugs were started out pretty much in 1900, around there, and um, the first map patented in 1906, and um, we'll look at those, and then we'll look at um, the military keys, and there's a huge number of military keys, of course, because uh, there were a lot of wars in that time. <laughs> okay, so we start out, who the heck made the first key? And unlike most popular history. It was not Samuel Morse. It was Joseph Henry. And in 1832, he made this thing that you see on the right. It doesn't look much like a key, but it worked like a key. And so he should really be credited with being the inventor of the first key. And he happened to be on a ship coming back from Europe with Samuel Morse. And Henry was a professor at Princeton. And uh, he had discovered the telegraph and got an actual working telegraph system working between his laboratory and his home uh, back in the early 1830s. So he had this system that he had worked out and he built these very early keys and he was a professor and he didn't think that he should patent this. He thought that this was so important. He saw the global importance of communication, electrical communication. He thought it was so important that he couldn't patent it. It wouldn't be right. And so he didn't patent it. And along came Morse and said, I'll patent it if you're not going to. And even if you are, and Morse took the patent, he patented it, and then he just gradually took all the credit for having invented the telegraph key. And uh, everybody pretty much thinks Morse was the initial inventor, but it was Joseph Henry. Now, there are other people who were working on telegraph in those days. This uh, notebook that you see on the left was discovered by a friend of mine in a, an old bookstore. And he looked inside and he found the drawing of what may be the very first key that was invented. It's a little hard to tell whether this drawing was made before or after Henry came along. But you can see down here this rather rough drawing that was made of a telegraph key. And that was in England and invented or drawn. The notebook was uh, by Cook. Um, James Father Gil Cook. And uh, here are some of his other telegraph keys. There's one where you send the code by pulling down on a rope, and another picture in his book up there. And you can see a picture of him over here with something that looks very much like a telegraph key. So those are the contenders, Willie, if you will. And people are still arguing about that. And the Morse family to this day is arguing that they're Samuel F. B. Morse was the inventor and that this is all garbage and so on. Anyway, here's a picture of a Cook and Wheatstone needle telegraph that was made back in 1832. And you can see a definite telegraph key in the horizontal platform. So the people argue about this. We won't bother getting into that argument. But of course, Samuel Morse took credit for this. He patented the, his telegraph system in 1836. And uh, his initial key was made for him by a man by the name of Vale. And it was a strap key, just a simple spring contact. And uh, he didn't find that to be very uh, easy to operate. So Vale went on and invented the first key that we know of. Uh, it looks very much like keys that we're familiar with. And you see that down there. So the, uh, the one on the bottom is called the Vail Lever Correspondent. 
And of course, Morse would prefer to call it the Morse Libra correspondent. And they, they had a terrible fight. The Vale family and the Morse family hated each other, even though Vale had been Morse's assistant and invented these things and even had a major role in inventing what is now called the Morse code because Vail was a musician and he developed the Morse code on the basis of some musical theory. You can actually a uh, own a pretty good replica of the first key. It's made by Kent in England and it comes looking horrible because they spray paint the whole mechanism with gray. And indeed, what you have to do is grind all that off with a wire brush and then you have to take the thing and age it for a couple of years. And there are various ways to age keys. The uh, Probably one of the best ones is just to bury it in uh, wet ground for about a year or two, and it ends up looking like that. And that's a lot closer to the real, um, the real key. The original is shown over here. You can see it actually is broken right in the middle there. There's a little patch break, but that's supposedly the absolute first of the Vail keys, and that's in the Smithsonian Institution uh, in Washington. Um, so we move on. We have landline keys and we have competition for who can sell the most and uh, therefore make the most money out of them. And they started out with these keys that looked a little bit like what we're familiar with, a great big lump in the middle and a knob that we're familiar with and a trunnion, a little uh, hinged um, uh, point here where you can adjust the tension on the thing. But they all had this terrible flaw in that the trunnion um, rod was press fit into the key itself. And the problem was that after you use this thing for a while, here's another one, after you use it for a while, the rod comes loose and the key itself, the lever starts moving left and right. And so they became useless. And that's one of the reasons that camelback keys, as they're called, because they have this hump, some of the old timers call them humpback keys, uh, are so rare because people threw them out. Hey, this key's worthless, it's not working anymore, I can't fix it, throw it out. So very hard, if you see a camelback key, they generally are quite expensive and quite rare. Running back here, if you were to find one of these, uh, you would be, capable of getting maybe $7,000 for it from a collector. Um, these about the same, six or 7,000. Here's another one. I actually paid 5,000 for this one. It's a beautiful, beautiful camelback. And again, you can see there's nothing keeping that rod in place. So eventually the lever's gonna slide back and forth and be a, be a problem for you. Sometimes you find tiny little ones and it's hard to imagine what they are used for unless maybe they're put inside pocket spy telegraph sets. But this is, again, obviously a camelback. So the first thing you want to recognize in any key that you're looking at is whether it's a camelback key or not. And if it is, you say, oh, ooh, this is important. And as you'll see, there are other turnoffs when you see a key that you can say, well, this is worthless, essentially. Okay, here's another camelback key. You can see the lump in it. Nobody has any idea why they put that there. It serves no purpose, doesn't help with the balance or anything. And again, you see that darn pin, which can slide back and forth in the design and a major design flaw. Here's another one, beautiful key. This is not a camelback, but it's a beautifully carved straight lever key with a drop in it. And it's something that came along just a little bit after the camelback era. So we're looking at uh, uh, evolution in values from maybe five to 7,000 for a beautiful old camelback down to maybe 1,500 for something that looks like this. But again, the critical thing is look for a brass lever and look for a unprotected pin going through the thing. And those are indicators that they're old and therefore valuable. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Here's another one. Um, and you'll actually see this one on display in my 
by my uh, telegraph setup out there. And again, you can see how this thing is uh, going through there. And again, it doesn't have a camelback, so it's a little less expensive and valuable than the others, but it does have what are called legs. And these legs were designed to actually go through the operating table and the connection, the electrical connection, this key was made under the surface of the table. So you just plop this thing on, connect underneath the table, and it got rid of messy wires and stuff like that. And uh, so that was the history of the very early competition. And every one of those makers of those keys was in competition with every other maker for who could make the best key and therefore sell the most keys. And in 1888, a man named Jesse Bonnell came along, and he had been uh, one of the telegraph operators, it is said, uh, for President Lincoln. And Lincoln had an elaborate telegraph station in the White House. And uh, it's interesting because that's during the Civil War. If you look at virtually any book on the Civil War, you look in the back in the index, you look up telegraph, it isn't there. Most of the historians of the Civil War don't even mention telegraph, which is very strange because it played an immensely important part in the strategy that Lincoln used. He was getting telegraph signals from all his generals during the war, and yet it isn't mentioned. Anyway, uh, Jesse invented what he called the triumph key. And it was a triumph because he said it was the last key that would ever be invented because it was perfect and you better buy it. And he was basically right. The triumph key was so different from the others, it had a steel centerpiece here and the trunnion was not movable, it was part of the steel. So nothing could go wrong with this key and they were very, very cheap to manufacture. You didn't have to machine um, complicated brass uh, levers. Instead, you could just stamp these things. And so they were cheap to make and they took over and people literally threw out all the other stuff that we've just looked at and that's why they're so sought after by collectors. They're hard to find. And so Bonnell's triumph key was the critical point. And remember that you're looking at a key. The first thing you look at is the lever a steel lever. If it is, the value of that key cannot be more than $100. It's just way, way down. And even a beautiful one like this, and this was his very first model with little screw down additional things on the terminal. You can't get more than $100 for that. Whereas if that had been a Camelback, you're talking $3,000, $4,000, $5,000. So that's the first takeaway from the talk is look for the lever. And if it's steel, it's basically not worth anything. Here are some examples of steel lever keys. You'll see them everywhere. Every telegraph office in the world literally used these, or in America certainly, because they were a triumph. They, they were very well designed. Nothing ever went wrong with them. Look at a J38, same design, World War II, and uh, perfectly uh, delightful. And the problem was that Bunnell couldn't sell them for a lot of money and to charge, you know, $3 for maybe a key like this and uh, uh, 50 cents or a dollar for these keys back in those days. So it wasn't a great deal of money in individual sales, but he sold thousands and thousands of them. Think of every telegraph office in America having one of these. And at some point he put his name up here, Bonnell, on his Triumph key. And here's a, a pretty one. It's nicely shined up. It's uh, mounted in association with a sounder. But a set like that shouldn't be worth more than about $100, even though it's very historic. It dates back into around 1900 or so. And it's pretty to look at. But because it has a steel lever, tens of thousands were made. And anything that's made in that kind of quantity is not going to be very valuable. So here is another example. Bonnell decided that this, this key was too expensive for people and too expensive for him to make. So he stamped this one out of metal, the, ba the uh, base of the thing out of metal, and put the stamped key in the middle. And he sold these things for about 50 cents a piece. 
a dollar fifty if you wanted the sounder and the key on the board. So he was into volume sales, and uh, he had a product that had no competition, literally. This is the one exception uh, in which he built these tiny miniature keys, very small, very, very small, as you can see. That's my hand there. And these keys were totally functional, both the sounder and the key, and they were typically given uh, as gifts to old-time telegraphers, and they were hung on uh, the keychain, for instance, of, of these guys, or the watch fob. And that's why that little hook is on the end there. And uh, they're very, very sought after. If you find a set like this, it could be as much as $1,500. It could be as little as $1,000. But the neat thing is there are a lot of these things that were made, and they often turn up in jewelry cabinets at flea markets. You know, you find the big bins full of jewelry and everything, somebody's entire jewelry collection of a lifetime and estate. And there is a Bonnell t miniature key or sounder. And they, they figure, oh, that's just garbage and you'll get it for two or three dollars. So I, I spent a lot of time looking in a state jewelry collection, never found one, but the theory is good. You can might well find one. If you do, let me know. I'd love to know. Anyway, the problem with these keys was that after you use them for a while, uh, it is possible to develop something that was called telegrapher's cramp uh, or glass arm in which you your arm hurt from using the telegraph key. We now call that carpal tunnel syndrome, but of course they didn't know what that was back then. And it actually put a lot of telegraphers out of business. They couldn't continue sending Morse with the key because it hurt too much. Nothing they could do about it. And uh, so Bunnell realized that and he built another kind of key and it's called a Bunnell side swiper. And with this key, instead of going up and down, you go left and right with this. And you main same kind of contact. You have a contact on the left, you have a contact on the right. But this cured people's glass arm. They could just rest their hand on the table and rock their hand back and forth a little bit and send Morse with these things. So he did a tremendous service for a lot of telegraphers who were initially completely put out of work and he came up with this and then there were others who came up with similar designs this is uh, called the 20th century key made by a company called Tillotson they had to get around Bunnell's patent and uh, so you operate this key with your hand left and right again it, it helps with the glass arm syndrome so that's a little uh, rundown on the winner Bunnell and his keys the next we look at foreign keys and uh, we see that the basic design of the foreign keys is similar to the American keys. And for some reason, they copied the camelback in their keys and they copied it quite late, even later than the Americans were using a camelback. Doesn't make any sense, doesn't serve any purpose, no need to use that much brass but they made them that way. And this is about the earliest German camelback key that you can find. And although it's very, very early, not very popular in the United States among collectors. So you're gonna have trouble getting more than three or $400 for this, even though it dates back to the camelback era. Um, just, I, I don't know why, but they're just not very appealing. And then they sort of evolved in this kind of same idea with a camelback in the middle, a high knob, and uh, they just made these all the way up into the 1950s. So these are the classic German camelback keys, and uh, they persisted, and they're not very valuable to collectors. But you can see clearly the American camelback uh, influence. They also made straight lever keys like this, and you'll notice that they put a locking screw in. Now, why couldn't our guys have put a locking screw in? Because they had this stupid camelback in there, and it wouldn't fit a locking screw. Maybe that's the answer. But the Germans uh, didn't bother, in this case, with the uh, camelback, and so they could put this locking screw in virtually every foreign key that you see after their 
initial camelback uh, period, which is here, and again, there's a problem here that these can slide back and forth. But when they started realizing that, they just fixed it by putting a screw in there. Now, the Americans fixed it by inventing a whole new kind of key called the Triumph key. So it was an interesting trade-off. Anyway, the set screw there prevented it from sliding back and forth. And this is a classic German straight lever key used all the way up into the 1950s. And the weird thing about these keys is that the contact, the lower contact, as you can see here, is uh, on a spring, a, a leaf spring, so that when this um, screw comes down, makes contact with it, it bends it down a little bit. And the same thing on this contact, when the screw comes down, it bends the contact a little bit. Tremendous argument among many of us key collectors. Why would the Germans do this? My favorite theory was always that it makes much better electrical contact because if you have a key a contact coming down and you have another contact over on the side and they bending there's a little wiping motion as the as the contact comes down it wipes slightly laterally when the lower part comes down i thought maybe that was the answer but somebody fi finally found the answer in a german book uh, that said basically it was to make the key quieter so it wouldn't click as much and that seems sort of dumb to me but it's an easy way of identifying german keys all of the german keys almost without exception have this spring-mounted lower contact and uh, it's interesting to see why here's a french post and telegraph key, you can see the same influence. Most of the European keys have a big solid lever like this one, a lock screw, and some kind of base that's a little bit different from country to country. Here's an Italian key, very similar as you can see. Cute idea on this one, instead of a shorting switch, when you put your hand on the knob, it moves this forward and unshorts the contacts and allows you to use the key. Little minor variations. Uh, all of the foreign keys, even keys like this in beautiful condition like this, are not going to bring more than maybe $200 tops, no matter how nice they are looking. Here are some Swiss telegraph keys. Again, you see the same thing, big solid lever, set screw to lock the trunnion in place and uh, otherwise quite similar. Uh, here's a British key again with somewhat the same design, big solid supports here and sometimes large contacts off to the side. Here's a somewhat of an exception. This is a Swedish key and these were invented back in the 1870s, uh, mostly by Ericsson, a Swedish maker. And the nice thing about this key is it has a big long lever. It really has fabulous feel. You know, lean on that lever, it's just super crisp and the contacts are made out here with a little spring so you get a very sharp contact and they're beautiful keys to operate. They're just very nice. They're selling for about $250. There are a fair number of them around. You find them on eBay, but they're really, really beautiful both in use and uh, in design. So we move over now to spark keys and we're looking at Marconi and his grasshopper key. And the grasshopper key, you can see down here, his assistant has his hand on this really weird looking key. And we want to look a little closer to what the grasshopper key looks like. And it looks like this, like no key you could ever imagine using. I mean, you can just imagine what it would feel like to take that, that key and key down, key up and uh, no idea why the design was like this, except possibly they used fairly high voltage and it arced, and you had to perhaps separate the contacts by more distance with this early spark key than you would with the later keys, and uh, that might be an explanation. I have a, a little video here. You can see him using it. It's really neat. This is Marcar Marconi himself and he's about to sit down and use the key. There he goes. Dit, 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 da. Dit, 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 da. Dit, 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 
I don't know quite what he's sending. But anyway, that's the way the key looked when he was sending with it. And he was very proud of his invention, and rightly so, I think. If you could find a grasshopper key, most collectors would think you were God. There are only two or three of them known to exist. One I've seen in the Science Museum in Prague, and I don't know of any others. But that's sort of the holy grail of all keys. If you could find that key, an original, people would bow down and say, you're the greatest collector in the world. They're just not around, as far as I can tell. And if you move on to another of the Marconi keys, this one is also very rare and very much sought after. It's called the guillotine key. It's sort of like this was a big knife for cutting off people's heads. And this big arm here on the side of the key is held up by a piece of rope. And it keeps that up. And if the contacts get welded together uh, on this key, uh, pulling that arm down shorts out the system and allows you to try and break the welded together contacts. And this is for use with a very high powered spark transmitter. So those contacts are liable to fuse together. Uh, these keys, I, I had one, I sold it for $20,000. They're about as rare as any key can get it that is short of a grasshopper key. So they're very much sought after. There are probably four or five of them around. The uh, sister ship of the Titanic had one, the Carpathia. And this one I just turned up was in some guy's backyard in England. He didn't even know what he had, but uh, I did. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and many people have made replicas of this key. It's such a popular and historic design. This is a, a British ham who made this beautiful replica. And a friend of mine, David Halle, uh, Vermont ham, decided that he was going to make a miniature um, Titanic guillotine key. And this is it down here. And he made it so perfectly, came over, measured every aspect of mine, including the thread pitch. And he was a pretty good machinist. He made this thing absolutely perfectly. So there was just no way to tell that it wasn't an original Marconi design, even to the nameplate, uh, but in miniature. And he sold that key for about $8,000. So you're getting into pretty big money when you're talking about the Titanic uh, keys. And Kent in England makes a replica of the Titanic key, which they call the Titanic key. And I think you can see it's a pretty poor replica of the key, but it's still a replica. And if you want to have something on your table that looks a little like the Titanic Marconi key, then you can buy the Kent. And it's, it's close, <laughs> sort of. Uh, we look at other kinds of keys. This is a World War I submarine spark key. And again, with spark transmitters, you're keying a lot of current, and the keys, the contacts spark when you key the transmitter. And in a submarine where the atmosphere in the submarine may be explosive because of the battery chemicals, uh, batteries give off hydrogen, you don't want open sparks in a submarine. You definitely don't want open sparks. So they designed what they called a flame-proof key. And that means that the entire contact assembly is totally enclosed uh, out of the air. And there's no way that the spark of the contacts closing when you press the key uh, can ignite the atmosphere. And this is a Marconi. World War I submarine key, and that would be worth anywhere from five to $6,000. They're quite rare because there aren't many uh, submarines that didn't sink at one point or another. And uh, uh, when you scrap a submarine, you're looking primarily for the scrap metal, and they don't bother taking things like valuable telegraph keys out. They just scrap the whole thing and melt it down. Here's a typical World War I American Navy key. This was used on thousands of, make it hundreds of, destroyers in the North Sea during World War I. And they're quite rare and very beautiful. They just have a wonderful balance to them. You can see where the electrical contacts are made through the table, and so you don't get electrical shocks there. And these would sell for maybe between uh, $3,500 to $4,000. 
if you had a nice one like this. Uh, this is a German World War I Air Force flame-proof key, and you can see that the contacts are enclosed so they don't ignite the uh, aviation fuel that might be floating around inside an airplane. There's this uh, oil-filled cup there, and uh, nobody's fully sure why the knob oh, looks like this on German Air Force keys, except that they didn't have very good heaters and you had to wear gloves and very heavy clothing and if you're going to have a glove on it's easier to key something if you have a big handle to press against than if you're trying to find a little knob so that's the general explanation for why those high knobs are present in german keys there's another german world war one air force key and we go to american keys and this is a key that was used to key the big uh, spark transmitters on shore, and it was made by Massey. And there's a guy in uh, Radio Row in New York named Phil Weingarten who made counterfeit copies of this, and he sold them as original to people for $5,000. And that was, what, maybe 30 years ago, so $5,000 was a lot of money. And uh, he claimed that they were original. He went to great lengths to try and make them look perfect. He even sand cast the label on the things. But that's where he failed. His labels were not very good. And you can tell a, 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 a counterfeit key from a real one by looking at the label. He also was dumb enough, instead of um, putting a brass screw, uh, he put a cadmium plated 1024 uh, one quarter 20 screw into the handle there and you unscrew the handle and you can see that and you know that's a counterfeit. So I got this one from somebody who'd been swindled by him. Uh, Phil Weingarten always kept a loaded Luger under the cushion in his sofa in his living room for people who came and were annoyed at him. And he sold dozens of these keys. He sold other Marconi copies and people hated him. Then he decided he was gonna make his own deforest Audion tubes. And he made counterfeit Audion tubes and sold those. And that got him a whole bunch of other people who hated him. Anyway, that's a whole different talk. Phil Weingarten story is kind of interesting. If you were ham, this was the spark key that you lusted over, but it was so expensive. It cost four and a half dollars. It was the Clap Easton Boston spark key. And they were just beautiful. You can see the contacts here, and nicely made, beautiful base. If you had an extra 50 cents, they would put it on a marble base for you. And that was just incredible. But most hams didn't have that kind of money, not even close to it back in the 20s. That was a lot of money. And so with ham ingenuity, what they did was to take two dimes, which were pretty much silver in those days, and solder the dimes onto an old Triumph key, which they could get cheap, few dollars. And by soldering these dimes in place, they made silver contacts, and they worked really well with spark transmitters. So this is called a dime key. And if you look carefully in flea markets like this, you'll see a lot of them around. You, you come across a, a Triumph key and say, ah, it's just a Triumph key. And then you look a little closer and you see the, the dimes on and you say, I know what that is. Some ham decided to save a little money and uh, solder a few uh, dimes on there. Um, there is a nice signal electric uh, company spark key that was made. You'll find these in the flea market. There's so many of them out there that they don't have much value. You might get as much as $75 for these, but if people didn't realize what they had, um, they would probably sell it as uh, just a telegraph key and you might get it for 20 or $30. So that's a fairly early version of the signal electric key, but they were made in huge volume, so they don't have a lot of value. Okay, move on to semi-automatic bugs and they were patented in 1904. This is Gil Schliemann, and he is the bug king of America. He has found by now over 400 different bugs, and that means different makers or different models 
of a bug by the same maker. And that's a huge number. And that gives you an idea of how big the market was for bugs. If you had a bug design that you could sell, uh, you, could, you could make a lot of money, but you had to be real careful not to impinge on the Fiberplex patent. And that was the critical thing. If you did, the Fiberplex would sue you and you'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> anyway, here's Gil with one of the most difficult keys to find a vertical Fiberplex, also called an upright, also called a line chief's key. And they were a special design of Fiberplex with a very small footprint. And the theory is Fiberplex did this uh, so that the key wouldn't take up as much space as a normal bug on the table of a busy telegraph operator. So we start out with the 1904 Fiberplex. And you can tell the super early ones have a little set screw in the end of both of these bars. And that sort of is a clue to the fact. And they also have a very low serial number. If you find a Fiberplex with a serial number under 10, uh, that's worth about $5,000. If you find a Vibroplex with a serial number under 100, that's worth uh, maybe um, oh, three, dollars $400. And if you find a Vibroplex with a serial number over 100, it's almost worthless because over 300,000 Vibroplex keys were made. And they were made in this general design. This is called the original, and it was the original. And it was modified. Some of these little set screws were taken away to make manufacturing simpler. And uh, as you will see, they, they became smoothed out. This is the Vibroplex presentation model from about 1960. And this is the key the guy wouldn't sell me because <laughs> I couldn't send fast enough. The one thing that you want to look for very carefully when you look at a Vibroplex is whether it's a left-handed or right-handed one. If you look at this one carefully, you realize it's a left-handed Vibroplex in that when you move the lever to the left, it's going to make dots. And with a normal one, it's the opposite. So if you find a left-handed Vibroplex, you triple the value. But even so, this key, beautiful condition, is not going to sell for more than $100. And if you have a lefty, maybe you get $250 to $300, and they're pretty rare. Anyway, move on to look at how the original changed. It didn't. <laughs> They took away a few screws. They did a few things differently. But basically, the original was made and is made in about the same way as it always was. During the war, uh, the uh, Vibroplex company couldn't make enough telegraph keys uh, to keep up with the demands of the war. And they actually licensed <clears throat> other companies to make this key. It was a called the J-36 and military key for World War II. And uh, uh, so there are a lot of these around, tremendous number. They sell for about 150 bucks with the Signal Corps label on them, indicating that they were military. Now, Vibroplex did some strange thing. This is basically a Vibroplex key, but they narrowed down the base and they put little legs on here to stabilize it. And this is called a Vibroplex midget. And this was not a popular key. And immediately recognize when something's not a popular key. Ha ha, collectors want it. It's valuable. A midget uh, has sold for as high as $9,000. Um, I had one. I think I may have sold it for 7000 at Dayton. Um, they, they're very much in demand by collectors, but uh, they were not great keys and they were not a great design, but they are very rare. Um, here's the Fiberplex vertical. Again, very small footprint on the operating table. Instead of the horizontal movement, you can see it's vertical. If you compare it to the midget, you can see that all they really did was take a midget and turn it up vertically and put the knob in a funny place down there. And they have basically a similar key. Vibroplex verticals are very rare and very much sought after. I can't imagine one selling for less than 5,000. And I know they've gone for as high as 11,000 bucks. There are not a lot of them out there, but they're really neat things to have. 
and uh, very, very collectible. Here's a picture of the old Fiberplex company to let you know how these keys were made. And they were made by hand, basically. You have all these machine tools that were used by hand to shape the original keys. And uh, that has evolved into this company and a computer-controlled machine that actually uh, drills the holes in the base plates, for instance, of a Vibraflex key automatically. So you can see the evolution of key making from handmade into computer uh, operated uh, machinery. Uh, some more pictures of the Vibraflex uh, plant and some of the machines that are used for making bases and so on, and some of the completed bases. So they're still going at it. They're hand assembling the keys, as you see here. And the beautiful thing about the Fiberplex company is that they aren't quitting on people after they sell a key. If you have a Vibraplex key, you can send it to the company and they will look at it and they will make out a list of things that it needs. And then they will hand refurbish it for you and send it back to you. And no matter whether it was made 50, 60, 70 years ago, and it's amazing that that company does it. It's uh, very, very uh, inefficient of them, but it's a beautiful thing to do for all the people that bought Vibraplexes in the past. I'm very impressed by the Vibraplex company. Along comes a guy named McElroy, and he says, ah, I'm going to make some keys, and I'm going to make them just different enough so Vibraplex can't impinge, that I'm not going to impinge on the Vibraplex pattern. And he made a bug that looks like this. I have one up here on the table you can take a look at. And uh, McElroy was a real salesman. He was a pushy salesman. And uh, one of the things he did was to cast the base of his key as a brag sheet. Uh, it says, Patent applied for 1934, semi-automatic telegraph and radio code transmitter. Mac key 984, he says. Manufacturer, and this is using telegrapher shorthand, manufacturers adjusted and guaranteed by T.R. McElroy, world's fastest radio telegrapher, Boston, Massachusetts. So these are neat keys to have because they really are solid. They have a nice solid base and feel free to come up and play with this one that's up here. You can see the casting in the base. Very exciting to see a key like that and to get to play with, but they're still, they don't sell for much. Even. You can usually find them if they don't, if someone doesn't realize how nice they are, they'll sell them for a hundred and quarter maybe. Uh, the maximum you should have to pay might be $200 for one, depending on condition. Mac Galroy also said, you know, a bug should never be made shiny because the light will get into a telegrapher's eyes. And then somehow he had a turnaround and he made shiny bugs. This is the Model 600, maybe two, three hundred dollars on. I just saw one down in the lower parking lot. Um, and, and I don't know why he changed his mind, except that I think he thought he could sell more keys if they were shiny than if they were black. And so he gave up on his telegrapher. Should never, well, anyway. So that's McElroy. Now, McElroy also wanted to make money. And so he made a really cheapo key, totally stamped out of steel metal plate, just like a, a Chinese kid's toy, just stamped out of metal. It is the cheesiest, junkiest feeling key when you lift it up. But that is one of the most valuable keys in the world. That is a key that is sought after by virtually every collector that knows anything about telegraph key collecting because everybody who had one threw it away. <laughs> he may have sold quite a few of them, but there is such garbage that people just threw them away. And so there are very, very few of them that have survived. I managed to find one in 40 years of hunting 
And I think I sold it at Dayton for maybe $8,000 uh, $8, there. Just incredibly rare and ugly and terrible. It's not even something you want to have in your display cabinet. It's that bad. <laughs> and then there's another one. Bunnell decided he wanted to make big money. And instead of just copying Vibraplex or doing something like Vibraplex, he designed his own, own bug. And to make it look better, he gold-plated the damn thing, and he called it the Bunnell Gold Bug. And it is singularly the worst feeling bug that's ever been made. You can perhaps see that when you move the lever back and forth, the uh, contact out here is going to bend and it's a mushy feeling bug, nothing crisp about it. And it's just awful. It's so bad that he didn't sell very many and that immediately said, okay, they're valuable. But uh, it, the problem was he made many. So there are a lot of them out there and he didn't sell many. And he finally, he ended up with uh, <clears throat> terminal uh, Arrow, Arrow Electronics. And if you bought $50 worth of stuff from Arrow, it didn't matter what it was, condensers or radios or whatever, test equipment, they would give you a free Bunnell Gold Bug along with your purchase somehow. That's good. <laughs> so they were literally giving these things away. They're nice to have in your collection. They look nice, but it's not something you want to put on the air very often. Uh, another guy came along with a different design. He said, you know, people should be able to rotate the knob out at the end a little bit to fit their particular style. And so he put in this rotatable mechanism and you can actually rotate the mechanism, the central part of this key, all the way over to make it into a straight key or all the way back so you can key it at almost any angle you want. And these are no, not very rare. He made a lot of them. Uh, Dow made typically in Minnesota and in Canada. So these these are maybe around three hundred dollars if you find one in this kind of condition, which is pretty good. Uh, the British made a really weird key called the Eddie Stone Bug Bug, <laughs> and it looks a little like a bug. And uh, the real sales point of this was the nice shape of the thing. But when you unscrew the top, you find that it's basically just a bug. It feels nice. The lever is nice, but they, they supposedly only made 200 of these. Um, maybe looking for the antiquity market, but even so, they're only worth maybe three hundred dollars uh, to a collector. This is an attempt at a fully automatic bug. A guy named Mel Hansen uh, developed this bug, known as the Melahan. He lived in California, and uh, this is the dash lever over here and the dot lever over here, and you have two paddles, so you can make dots on one side and dashes on the other, and they're both automatic. These are very rare keys. Uh, he only made a few of them because they were really terrible, <laughs> and it was almost impossible to adjust them. Look at all the many adjustments on the thing. People who have them have a lot of trouble getting them to send well. Um, but with a key that's only few of them are made, it's very valuable. And they're running in the seven to ten thousand dollar range also. And here is an Australian Automorse, fully automatic bug. And for some reason, although the design is fascinating, the key is fascinating, they don't bring a lot of money. You can sometimes find these for two to three thousand dollars as opposed to a Melahan, which will bring eight to ten thousand thereabouts. I don't know why. Really neat design. You can see it has basically a bug in the top paddle and a paddle down at the bottom. And it's an interesting key to have in your collection, but you find them on eBay and they're not out of sight. Um, now we move over to a German World War II bug. Uh, called the Novaplex, very straightforward design. Uh, they, they made a lot of these for World War II, so they don't bring more than about 100 to $150. And a man by the name of Gerhard Schur, a German, um, very meticulous machinist, made this beautiful bug, which he called the uh, uh, the Millennium Bug, the 2000 Bug, you can see labeled it down here. It didn't make very many of them, but they're pretty rare. They're 
probably worth between a thousand and two thousand dollars. Very nice bug to have. Here's a picture of him and me in my younger days, uh, and he has just given me that bug that you see there as a present, and uh, he's looking very proud. And he, he's a pretty neat guy. And here are some pictures of him making the bug. He does it all by hand and uh, just does a beautiful job with it. And he had more pictures of him at work. You can see him all of this stuff totally by hand. But the neat thing, he's built this incredibly complex a testing machine. Uh, and what it does, proofing means uh, testing in German. And this thing actually operates the bug <coughs> for days and days to make sure it keeps on working properly. So every bug that he sold, and in this case it's a paddle that he sold, uh, he tested with his machine. And of course, <laughs> as you can guess, he charged appropriately for these. Uh, I think he got uh, <laughs> about $800 for the bug, and uh, his paddles were uh, maybe 300 roughly, but neat guy to know. <coughs> and we have all kinds of nutty people out there, like Richard Mice, WB9LPU, who continually design different and unusual bugs. And they just <coughs> seem to get off on doing that. Uh, this is what he calls the rotobug, and it's magnificent, just incredibly well designed. The speed is adjusted with this little weight up at the top, and uh, you can see it has uh, magnetic contacts, uh, reed switches for the operation of the key. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's Richard with a couple of uh, his latest designs. The problem with Richard was he loved making different designs of keys, and he never, <coughs> excuse me, managed, <coughs> okay, stop. Uh, he never managed to go into production on any of these. He just loved, he'd get one, he'd make it, he'd give me a, a, one of them, and he'd say, okay, now I'm off to another project. And people would just die to have some of his designs, and he never sold them in any quantity. Every once in a while, I'd make one for somebody as a gift. Uh, paddles started out with some pretty basic designs like the Autronic that you see up there. Uh, they, by the way, Richard never sold any of his keys, so I don't have even a general price for those. The Autronic paddles were uh, up at the top there. You see them, they're early paddles. And the one on the bottom is made by a German key maker named Hannes Bauer. And the problem with Hannes Bauer is he was just like Richard in that uh, he never stuck with a design. So he'd make two or three of these things and he'd say, ah, oh, got to fix that and change it. And he'd change it and then he'd change it again. And then he'd stop making his paddles and he'd go over and make some bugs and then he'd go back. And again, uh, he never made any more than I think three or four of a particular design at a time. So they're pretty valuable among European collectors, but uh, uh, in America, the Autronic paddles would bring maybe um, 70, 60 or $70. Uh, Hannes Bauer, nobody recognizes that name, so you can often pick them up very cheap, uh, maybe $40, $50, and certainly that price in Germany. Um, this is the weirdest paddle I've ever seen, uh, actually made by a Swedish company in which they just mounted a hacksaw blade in between two contacts and called it a paddle. And uh, a lot of those, I'm amazed, they, they show up all over the place. So they were pretty popular, despite the fact that they're just about the ugliest design you could imagine. Lots of other paddles. Brown Brothers are fairly famous, and uh, they go for a reasonable amount of money. Uh, a uh, paddle and straight key combination might bring 150. <laughs> Thank you, you're great. And the Kent made paddles over there, and there are a bunch of individual people that made uh, interesting paddles. You'll see some of these in the flea market. They're interesting designs, but none of them bring very much money. A Brown Brothers combo might be 150 to a collector. Uh, the other paddles, even though the ones on the bottom were initially sold for a lot of money, maybe uh, 
six, eight hundred dollars there. You can find them around typically for fifty or a hundred dollars at flea markets. And they're just sort of the designs that these people came up with. Excuse me. The um, Sideswiper paddle was also uh, possible to make your own by just taking a couple of J38 keys and mounting them. This was a QST article that sort of put Bonnell out of business with his side sweeper. You could make these, and in the days when this design came out, you could buy little J38 straight keys. And I hope you can see how the J38 straight key is very similar to the Triumph key metal lever and all. You could buy those for 25 or 50 cents a piece and make yourself a paddle for a dollar or two. Um, moving on to military keys. Um, everybody okay with another five or 10 minutes? Okay. Military keys, we start out with the Civil War and that's pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> telegraph was very important during the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln used it extensively in his telegraph office. And uh, Civil War telegraph keys are very valuable because there are not many of them out there. And many people don't even know about the role of the telegraph in the Civil War. But here's a classic Civil War Phelps telegraph key. Notice the camelback. They sell for about $2,500. You'll see one in my display over by my tent. Uh, and uh, they're very nice pieces to have in your collection. <clears throat> Probably the most interesting of the Civil War sets are the spy telegraph sets where you have a sounder on the left here that picks up the telegraph signal from two wires, one of which you throw over the enemy a telegraph line, the other you hook to your bayonet and jam it in the ground. So you're listening to the sounder going click, click, click with the enemy signals and you're listening in on them, sort of spying. And if you're good, you can actually send false messages to the enemy using a little telegraph key on the right. And of course, no spy is comfortable without a gun nearby. Uh, here is a very, very extremely rare Civil War telegraph set. And that's the set that I have up here on the table. It's a set that nobody's ever seen before. We don't even know what kind of box it came in, but uh, if you find something like this, it's generally worth uh, so much. The, these sets sell for twenty-five to forty-five hundred dollars, and this set should sell for eight to ten thousand because it's a maker Chubbuck that is known for making Civil War telegraph sets, um, but no one's ever seen one before, so it's, it's as rare as anything can possibly be, and you'll see it up here on the table. Uh, the American F World War I field telegraph sets look like this, and they typically can be found for about $100 to $150. They have a neat little leather case and a little soft leather area right over the telegraph key that allows you to send telegraph messages without letting the mud get into the uh, operation of the machine. Of course, World War I had very muddy trenches, and this is referred to as a World War I field telegraph set or trench telegraph set. Uh, World War I uh, flame-proof key was used in air aircraft, a beautiful big knob, very nice feel to that knob, easy to use. They sell for, oh, typically $40 in flea markets, and uh, uh, these, yeah, 150 for these. Uh, this is the classic American World War II Navy key. Uh, very, very nice design. Very easy to use telegraph key. And uh, I just saw one down in the flea market for $30. It's a real bargain if you like sending. One of the questions about this key, since it's nearly identical to the German key on the bottom, is did the Germans copy the um, design from the Americans, or did the Americans copy the design from the Germans? We don't know the answer to that. The American J-38 key, very popular, made by the tens of thousands, should be able to get them for um, as little as $25, but they're gradually going up to maybe $40. And again, you can see how they're derived from the Triumph key design with a steel lever. In the box, this key might bring $50 to a collector, but in general, you find them in the uh, well under $40.
And uh, here's a similar key on a leg strap that was used during World War II by tank drivers and uh, just very uncomfortable when you wear this thing for a while. If you've tried them for uh, mobile CW and they really hurt your leg after a while. And they bounce worse than if you have it mounted on the vehicle, I swear, because your leg is bouncing around. It didn't make a lot of sense. And these sell for anywhere from 25 to $40 or so if you find them. It's called a J45. There's an interesting little key uh, used for flashing signal lights. Uh, and the idea of this key was you, you just hold it and operate it like a pair of scissors and you have a long wire, 20 foot wire that goes over to the signal light. And the idea is you didn't want to be standing by a signal light when you were signaling in the, in the war because people would shoot at the light. <laughs> and so you need to be separated from the light and that's why the 20 foot wire would be. Uh, separating you and you could use this off to the side. Uh, you don't see many of these around, so they're going to cost maybe $30 if someone knows what it is and 10 cents if they don't. <laughs> it looks like total garbage. Uh, the British made a hundred different versions of what they called the WT8A keys and they looked everything like the one in the top and the one in the bottom, and they sell for $20, $25 typically. And the problem is nobody has ever managed to get all 100 versions of them, but we do know they're out there, and people are sort of trying to get 100 different WT8 MPs, like they're trying to get the uh, DX Century Club <laughs> award for uh, working different countries. This is a German uh, and British bathtub key. Looks a little bit like a bathtub, but the neat thing about it is you could take this little uh, spring-loaded um, roller here, roll it onto the knob, and it would hold the knob down permanently, and that would transmit a signal. And these things were used in aircraft. If the aircraft was shot down and it was going down, you wanted to send a continual signal to indicate where you were going down to the direction finding stations. Uh, and at the same time, you wanted to be able to bail out of the airplane. So uh, rather than the operator sitting there with the key down all the way down to the crash, he just flips this thing on and bails out, knowing that the airplane is transmitting and the, the uh, location is going to be um, transmitted. Those things are worth uh, maybe 50 to $75. This is a light blinker key that was used in bombers and in fighters during World War II during periods of, rail, of radio silence. And the idea was that you could blink the lights on your aircraft rather than sending uh, Morse code signals to the other aircraft in your squadron. And uh, so it was a, just basically a light blinker key. And they sell for about $50 if you can find them. Um, German World War II Junker key, uh, very, very widely made. There are a lot of them out there. They go for about 250 on eBay because they have just superb feel. There are little micrometer adjustments on the thing and they're very crisp, very nice. Junker kept on making keys well into the 1980s. So you have to be a little careful to get a wartime or pre-war Junker as opposed to a post-war. And you can tell by a little uh, writing on there that says Deutsches Reiches Patent, uh, a patent for it. Germans also used a mouse key, it's a, sort of like a computer mouse, tiny, tiny little key clipped on your parachute harness. And you could use it for transmitting on the backpack radio while you were parachuting into enemy territory. If you can find one with the little swastika eagle inside, they're worth about 250 bucks, mounted on a, a metal base like that, maybe 100, 150. They're clearly World War II keys. This is a Japanese key from World War II. Typically, with the Japanese writing and all, you get 100 to 150 dollars more. You can see the classic uh, European kind of design: big solid lever, solid supports. And we move on to Russian keys. The Russian keys are almost all in a gray case like this, and they can be bought for as little as 
$5 in Europe and maybe $15 here. There's a beautiful little tiny Russian key uh, and makes a good QRP key. But uh, there's so many of them out there made by the Russians from the 1960s into the 1980s. They're, they're not very collectible. This is an interesting Russian helicopter key with the Russian writing on it. And uh, finally, we end up with uh, two guys who are such avid key collectors that they have tattooed their uh, love of keys on their arm. And I just saw one of them, Brad W1AY, was walking around the flea market letting people take pictures of his, <laughs> his tattoo. It's very impressive. Uh, you can see Vale and uh, some of the other telegraph greats on that. And here's another guy with Morse and Martin who invented the Vibroplex uh, system and Armstrong. So when you get really carried away in key collecting, I guess you start decorating your body. And finally, we have a kid looking at a display that I had at Dayton, and that's really hope for the future. We hope that the kids won't forget this. An interesting thing has happened. There's a club called the LICW Club, Long Island CW Club, which started out as a local club in Long Island and now has 3,500 members in it. And they give constantly, all day long, seminars on the internet on sending, they coach people, they cheer when somebody has made their first contact online, uh, they take kids and, and sort of ease them into things. They run live seminars where on the internet, one guy will put out a CQ call, someone else will answer him on CW, and they they um, play this whole thing right on the website. So you can watch a complete QSO from both ends and both of the people are in the same, in two different Zoom windows. So they're really doing wonderful stuff for bringing CW back. And uh, I think that's my goal to get people interested in CW. I have a, uh, a telegraph book that is the only guidebook to telegraph keys and their values that's ever been printed. And I sold a lot of those for a while. Our ARRL sold them, the RSGB sold them, but recently, about six months ago, they said, Tom, we can't sell them anymore. And so I've got a huge number of them, <laughs> literally, left over. And you're welcome, since you've suffered through this, to take one of those as a gift. And uh, I guess what I'm going to have to do is put them on the Internet and just let people come into the PDF and enjoy it. I also have a Telegraph Collector's reference CD, which is sort of like a library, but people aren't interested enough to buy them anymore. So I've got to, got to get rid of this stock before I die, and it's getting close at 84. So I hope you enjoyed that. Our hope for the future is the Fiberplex company is wonderful. Uh, Begali is a fantastic guy. He's making all kinds of new keys, and people love them. And here's a picture of uh, Begali giving me his latest key uh, back at the, I guess it was at the Dayton Ham Fest. So there's a lot of fun to be had, and there's a Morse Telegraph Club, a lot of people that are very excited about continuing the old Morse code stuff. And that's it, the history of Telegraph Keys. So come up and grab a free book, play with the uh, McElroy, and thank you for bearing with me and take a look at the... Thank you. Spy set. Yeah, very good. Very good. Great.